Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today's main presentation will be offered in English, but allow me to make a short opener in French. Bienvenue à ce webinaire présenté en collaboration avec Investissement Québec International et les bureaux du Québec en Chine. Nous y discuterons de comment placer vos fondations légales pour réussir en affaires en Chine. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais vous inviter à nous poser vos questions tout au long de la présentation en utilisant le bouton Q&A situé au bas de votre fenêtre de visionnement. Nous tenterons d'y répondre à la fin de la séance. Je m'appelle Philippe Janot, je suis le directeur de la section Québec et de la section des Prairies au Conseil d'affaires Canada-Chine. Le Conseil d'affaires Canada-Chine est un organisme qui compte maintenant quelques 300 entreprises membres canadiennes et chinoises représentant tous les secteurs d'affaires. Le CCBC a sept bureaux, dont cinq au Canada, soit à Montréal, Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary et Halifax, ainsi que deux bureaux en Chine, à Beijing et à Shanghai. Nous donnons une présence permanente en Chine pour représenter les intérêts de nos membres. Nos bureaux de Beijing et Shanghai hébergent nos deux incubateurs d'entreprises permettant à nos membres canadiens d'utiliser nos locaux et salles de conférence au profit de leur développement d'affaires. À travers nos incubateurs d'entreprises, vous avez l'opportunité d'embaucher des employés directement en Chine pour supporter vos développements commerciaux sur place tout en réduisant ou éliminant vos besoins de voyager vous-même vers la Chine, chose qui s'avérera possiblement très intéressante pour encore quelques temps. Avec ce service, le CCBC se charge de la gestion administrative telle les salaires et contributions d'employeurs pendant que vous vous concentrez sur votre développement d'affaires. Nos gens au Canada et en Chine sont très bien outillés pour vous aider à régler vos défis entrepreneuriaux, que ce soit avec les différences culturelles dans les pratiques d'affaires, les politiques locales ou les compréhensions des marchés. Notre mandat est de s'assurer que vous soyez bien équipé pour chaque étape de votre parcours de développement commercial, que vous soyez au stade d'évaluation ou à l'étape de recherche de partenaires et d'investisseurs. Welcome to this webinar presented in collaboration with Investissement Québec International and the Bureau du Québec en Chine. We will discuss how to place your legal foundation for succeeding in business in China. Before we begin, I would like to invite you to ask us your questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your viewing window. We will attempt to answer them at the end of the session. My name is Philippe Janot, and I am the director of the Quebec chapter and the Prairies chapter at the Canada-China Business Council. The Canada-China Business Council is an organization that has some 300 Canadian and Chinese member companies representing all business sector. The CCBC has seven offices, including five in Canada, in, Mon in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, and Halifax, as well as two offices in China, in Beijing, in and Shanghai, giving us a permanent presence in China to represent the interests of our members. Our Beijing and Shanghai offices host our two business incubators, allowing our Canadian members to use our premises and conference rooms for the benefit of their business development. Throughout our business incubator, uh, through our business incubator, you have the opportunity to hire employees directly in China to support your business development on site while reducing or eliminating your need to travel to China yourself, something that will prove highly useful for some time to come. With, this, with, with these services, the CCBC takes care of administrative management such as salaries and employ, employer contribution while you focus on your business development. Our people in Canada and China are very well equipped to, sol to help you solve your business challenges, whether it is with cultural differences in business practices, local policies, or understanding the market. Our mandate is to ensure that you are well equipped for each step of your business development journey, whether you are in the evaluation stage or in the search or in search of partners and investor stage. Sur ce, je passerai la parole à Joanne Sun d'Investissement Québec International qui nous parlera de l'organisation et de leurs services. Merci Joanne. Philippe. Très bien, merci à toi. Euh, bonjour à tous. Euh, mon nom est Joanne Sun d'Investissement Québec International, Direction des marchés de l'Asie Pacifique et de l'Océanie. Together with Quebec offices in China, we are very pleased to collaborate with CCBC to host today's webinar. Thanks to our speakers, Robin Tabers, David Groover, and Monsieur Jean-François Lépine. For the majority of you, you are aware that since June last year, Export Quebec, the MEI, is integrated to Investment Quebec, and Investment Quebec International has been created with two priorities. Attraction d'investissement direct étranger et soutien à l'exportation et à l'internationalisation. Nous avons maintenant 33 bureaux dans 18 pays à l'extérieur du Québec qui couvrent les principales régions économiques du monde. 
en Asie, nous avons eu de représentation, dont quatre en Chine. Euh, les conseillers d'investissement Québec Exportation offrent un accompagnement personnalisé et aussi de groupe aux PME, mais aussi aux grandes entreprises dans leur démarche de développement de marché à l'extérieur du Québec. Les services offerts comprennent notamment l'identification de marchés porteurs et occasions d'affaires, les conseils stratégiques sur la culture et pratiques d'affaires, le financement de projets, la mise en relation avec des clients et des partenaires potentiels, la validation financière d'un partenaire étranger, l'organisation des missions commerciales et accueil d'acheteurs, le soutien auprès des autorités locales pour vos projets majeurs et le soutien à l'implantation commerciale à l'étranger. Le tout toujours en étroite collaboration avec le Bureau du Québec à l'étranger. Euh, très brièvement, quelques mots sur notre solution financière, programme exportation PEX. Il s'agit d'une subvention non remboursable pouvant aller jusqu'à 40% des dépenses admissibles. Je vous invite à consulter notre site internet section PEX pour avoir plus d'informations sur les projets et dépenses admissibles dans le cadre de ce programme. Merci pour votre attention et bonne conférence. Merci, Joanne, pour cette présentation. J'accueillerai maintenant Robin Tabers, associé chez RP China Lawyers, la firme est présente à Shanghai et Beijing. Robin nous fera profiter de ses années d'expérience juridique et commerciale pour nous partager les meilleures pratiques à suivre pour réussir en affaires en Chine. I will now welcome Robin Tabers, principal at RP China Lawyers. The firm is present in Shanghai and Beijing. From, uh, from his years of legal and business experience, Robin will share with us the best practices for doing business in China. Without any further ado, Robin, I give you the floor. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Um, So thank you for the opportunity to present to so many Canadians. Uh, it's late at night here in uh, Shanghai. So in contrary to what you, uh, what my background may suggest, I am actually not in the office, but, uh, but, but my shirt is definitely real. Uh, today I will be sharing with you uh, some of the experiences that, uh, that I've gained after supporting Western businesses uh, doing business in China in the last 10 years. You allow me to share my screen with you. Okay, so first I'll share a little bit of background uh, of, of, of the two firms uh, that I am uh, a partner of and later on I'll I'll guide you through four of the key topics uh, that I always share with Uh, with foreign companies that are interested in doing business in China or already has, uh, has made some steps and have some operations in China. Um, so first of all, I'm, uh, I'm a part in a law firm, RP China Lawyers. Um, the firm was established uh, 10 years ago uh, by, by, by my partner and I joined uh, shortly after. Uh, we've, uh, we've developed a the firm and thanks to uh, more than 1,000 clients that we've supported in the last 10 years. Uh, moreover, in the last six years, uh, many of these clients have asked us to provide also tax and accounting services. Uh, I'll uh, come Robin, to that a little bit. Uh, Robin, I'm just gonna interrupt you, I'm, I'm sorry. The, the screen we see is not your presentation. Uh, I wonder if you can take a look at your settings or otherwise we can uh, share from our end as well. Okay, what do you see? We see your uh, kind of a uh, folder selection for the file itself. Okay. Well, that's very weird because I see that I'm sharing this screen. So if you could share the presentation I sent you, that would be great. Give me a second. Yeah.
Okay. I believe your uh, presentation should be on screen. Just uh, guide me through the pages. Yeah, can you uh, flip to the next screen? Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Well, we tested this so many times, but uh, of course, right now it's it's not working. Um, yeah, so our our law firm is based in uh, in in Shanghai and Beijing. We have over over fifty staff. Uh, we specialize in supporting foreign companies that uh, do business in or or with China. Uh, we're structured as a as a PRC law firm, which means that our lawyers can go to court and can represent uh, clients. Uh, in, in government proceedings. Um, we operate on our, on our Western management uh, to, to ensure our clients that are advising our services up to the international standards that all our clients are, are used to back home. Now, furthermore, on the next slide, you'll see um, that we've uh, ventured into tax and accounting as well. Um, we've recently cooperated uh, with a Pan-Asian group called uh, Acclimb. Um, we, by the time we already employed uh, 20 accountants and tax advisors in Shanghai, Beijing and in Shenzhen, um, our key is to make uh, the life of foreign companies and, and the headquarters uh, very easy. So we take care of the monthly compliance, accounting tax, bank, uh, banking and treasury, uh, custodial, so stamp management and, and HR and, and payroll. Uh, the group itself is uh, present in Asia and 10 jurisdictions, and most of these offices are under under Western management in, in, in all the key cities in, in Asia. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I would like to start with, with explaining to you um, why I think China is important now. I think there's about there's about 100 people uh, on this call, um, and 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 many of, many of you have your own story with China. For me, uh, the story is that China is two things at the same time. Uh, one, it's the the source and capital of the world. It has taken uh, this role for for many years in the past, and 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 still in the present. And so, if you think of China has, has, has basically any raw material there is, so they can produce any, any, any product. Um, currently, there's still high quality production. Uh, there's more and more educated uh, labor force, so, so China is still attractive. Has a very good infrastructure uh, and logistics compared to, to its competitors in Asia. In, in, um, I would say the costs are still lowish but obviously they're rising extremely fast. So you also see that China, uh, Chinese government is focusing on, on high tech and high quality production. And some of the, the low cost production is moving to, to other jurisdictions such as Vietnam and Indonesia, India, Bangladesh. At the same time, uh, China has become the consumer capital of the world. So, I mean, the, the, the figures are uh, mind boggling. I think uh, in 2013, China was already the largest luxury market in the world. It was already the largest e-commerce market in the world. And that was seven years ago. Um, urban incomes are rising with, with 15%, if not more. That makes that uh, in two years, 630 million uh, consumers will have a middle-class status um, expecting to exceed 1 billion by 2030, according to McKinsey. So, because China is important, um, you better come very well prepared. So, I would like to present you four topics that I think are, are, are key for you uh, to, to comprehend uh, to, to the fullest extent before uh, sometimes you're even thinking about China or proceeding to China. So, first off, um, protect your IP. So, a lot of companies, um, they presume that their IP is their IP. Now, that is not necessarily true in your own jurisdiction, and that is uh, certainly also not true uh, in China. So if we dive deeper in the next slide, you'll, you'll see that I've listed uh, five intellectual property rights. Um, you see two that are highlighted uh, in, in, in gray. I think these are uh, a bit less important in China, so I'm gonna focus on, on uh, primarily the first two. So 
uh, trademarks and and patents are i think the most important um, assets of, of of many companies especially when you're when you're a brand selling uh, selling products or selling services uh, into china now patents work quite similar to in other jurisdictions so there's your invention uh, patent and there's your design patent what makes china unique is a utility model uh, this does not exist anymore or at all in most jurisdictions. Uh, it's basically uh, uh, a weaker version of, a, of an invention model, but it's, it's fairly used by, uh, by Chinese companies uh, to make the lives of uh, foreign companies uh, uh, pretty difficult in my experience. So if you have some, some technology and you believe it's not sufficient for an invention, it may be sufficient for a utility model. Now, for both trademarks and patents, and domain names the key is registration without registration you do not have any rights if you registered your trademarks uh, or or your uh, design patents or domain names in canada that is not valid in china with the exception of inventions which which carry global protection um, but in china the system works as a first to file system so if someone else applies before you in China, they have the right, no matter if you have 1000 stores or 50 million customers uh, throughout the world. Um, if you're not well known in China, it will be very difficult to even get that trademark back. Uh, and in the first place, if someone else register it, they will get it. There is no check by the government whether or not this is a famous mark or not. Um, so, protection, of course, is a very bad reputation uh, in in China. Um, so, I always recommend clients to 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 take a fourfold approach. First, acquire your IP rights. So, either by registration, but it can also be based on a contract or based on 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 acquiring the the IP rights from a third party. Um, second of all, manage your IP rights. Most of the IP infringements are being done by suppliers or by, uh, by customers, by your joint venture partners, or by your own employees. Um, so if you manage this through contractual arrangements, you can always make sure that you can reobtain these rights uh, pretty easily by, uh, by simple legal actions. Now, once you see that your IP rights are infringed, um, prepare for action, investigate, but also create evidence. Um, and make sure that you have um, the exact rights that you do want to enforce. And this is a big issue also on online platforms. A lot of brands, they really presume that they have the rights. Then I look at their portfolio in China and it turns out they do not have the rights. And then we're one or two years uh, away from them acquiring the, those rights before they can actually enforce those rights. And that will be the last step. So this is what, what I'm doing on a daily basis. I'm writing season assist letters, filing uh, uh, third party complaints on, on platforms to make sure that there's no uh, unauthorized uh, resellers or there's no counterfeits being, uh, being sold in China. So I wanna share with you some of the uh, war stories that I've um, witnessed uh, myself or that I've seen in, in, in the market um, on the next slide. So. I think a very common uh, misconception is that a lot of people think that there's an international trademark system. There is none. There's a so-called WIPO, World Intellectual Property Office, but it's nothing else than a coordination mechanism for each country. So each country has its own database um, with trademarks and international registrations can be converted um, but that's not always a very smooth pro uh, process and they have to be applied uh, in China uh, locally. So very famous case is, is iPad. There was a Chinese company that had absolutely no operations anymore. They were on the verge of bankruptcy, but they've applied for iPad when Apple only had iPod. Um, so surely Apple could litigate, they may win, but it simply took too long because they're about to launch iPad worldwide and in China. So they end up paying, I believe, around 65 million US dollars because one of their lawyers in the US was not paying attention 
and had um, failed to file iPad in China because they did so in other markets because that name was totally not known. So they made a mistake here in, uh, in China. And that was a very expensive mistake. Um, so that's something to learn from. Now, if someone has squatted your trademarks, I only see three solutions. One, you fight a legal battle that can go all the way up to court. Two, you buy the brand from um, the bad faith applicant. Or three, you change your brand name. For this letter, I want to dive into a quick uh, case study. Uh, one of our clients, a big uh, UK retailer, they didn't make a filing in China. They thought China was not in interesting to them until uh, they appointed a new CEO. He used to um, represent the company in China for 10 years. So he said, we're going to China only for us to find out that their trademark was uh, in fact stolen. So they made an economic decision. They said for us to rebrand um, only for China, rebrand the production, rebrand the marketing, while we have almost 1,000 stores worldwide is far too expensive. So we want to buy the trademark. And we end up paying 2.2 million US dollars to buy the trademark. And for them, that was way more expensive than their calculation of, uh, of, of rebranding. Um, so again, lesson learned, before you think of China, please register your trademark uh, before others do so. Um, consider also registering a Chinese trademark. Uh, I think Starbucks is the most famous example. Starbucks thought we're the most famous coffee brand in the world. Um, we don't need a Chinese trademark. We will uh, show everyone that we're Starbucks um, and that's our name. Um, the consumers thought differently. They started to use a Chinese name. Some local businessmen thought it would be a good idea to register it. And uh, legend has it that about 10 years ago, they opened 100 stores when Starbucks didn't even have three stores. Um, so a lot of consumers in Shanghai thought that actually the counterfeit Starbucks was a real Starbucks uh, because they couldn't even read uh, English or, or, or Pinyin. They couldn't read alphabet. Um, so there the same applies, consider to come up with a Chinese uh, trademark and register it before others do. That brings me to the second topic. Um, if you're looking at China, you should consider uh, what are your expansion models, what are your business models in, in, in China, um, and, and what are available legal structures if you decide to set up in the market. Now, very briefly, I would like to um, share with you the, the, the three options that are generally available. Now, traditionally, there's a representative office. This is a vehicle that exists for, for far more than uh, 20, uh, 20 years. Um, originally, foreign companies could not own a, a wholly owned subsidiary in China for 100%, so they had to either team up in a joint venture or set up this representative office. And the word itself says it, it can represent, but it cannot actually do any sale or any trade. It's just a liaison office. It's not often used. In the last 10 years, I have not set up any representative office compared to more than 100 rupees or joint ventures. So I'll leave the representative office for what it is. In the presentation, I'll briefly touch upon joint ventures uh, and wholly foreign owned uh, enterprises. The latter are being very popular right now because joint ventures are, for most industries, not mandatory anymore. Uh, China has a quite open uh, policy for most industries that they consider not being sensitive. Um, so it's the wholly foreign owned enterprise that will likely be uh, important to you. Diving deeper, I'd like to take you to, to some of the models um, to, to sell in China and to invest in China. So the first step that is available, I think, for, for any uh, a brand in Canada that is uh, uh, focusing on, on B2C or, or that has a product that leans itself for e-commerce, you have three options. One, you go in directly. You find a Chinese distributor and this distributor sells online or offline. It doesn't really matter to you. You have a B2B relationship with him and he sells it to the end consumer. Now, um, the likes of, of, of Alibaba have created, of course, a, a beautiful... Uh, Timo Global, in which you can actually directly sell your products into China to Chinese consumers using, using their platform. So we have 
no structure in China. Um, you basically deliver the products to Hong Kong and the platform will arrange for, for logistics to Chinese consumers. Now, if you want to go deeper into e-commerce, um, you could go directly and, and, and sell through domestic e-commerce platforms, but that would require you to set up an entity in China. And there it is, there's your Wufi, your own wholly foreign owned subsidiary in China that you could then consider. Now, I know there's many people on the call, um, so it's hard for me to tailor the presentation, but I tried to do my best. So I'm looking at um, companies selling uh, products in China and companies selling services in China. So starting with products um, can be both B2B uh, or B2C. For me, I see a big trend in sourcing in China for China. So 10 years ago, everyone sourcing in China and exporting. Then there was a big hype to import goods and sell in China. And what I see right now is sourcing in China or producing uh, yourself in China and, and selling in China. This is driven by an increased demand for Western quality products, um, which is both import and local production, as well as decreased margins in Western countries because production is getting more expensive and prices don't necessarily uh, go up in Western countries, but they do go up in China. Uh, China gets extremely expensive for any type of uh, Western products, whether it's whether it's in the supermarket or whether it's in the shopping mall, you're you're sure to pay a premium on the price you would pay for the same product in Canada. Looking at business models uh, for for products, if you source in China and you want to sell in China, um, there's a couple of uh, uh, models. If you want to import to China, the, the the latter three models will work. But if you really want to buy in China and sell in China without an entity, you could export and re-import. You could use a, a, a bonded a warehouse in a free trade zone. This is usually for one-time deals if the product is already in China and you have a buyer for it. Um, if you have some sporadic low value deals, you could consider using a, a trading agent who's buying on your behalf and you send him a, a commission invoice. Um, if you really want to penetrate the market a bit more, you could look at um, teaming up with a domestic distributor or, 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 or a partner, potentially a joint venture partner. Now, I always share that there's two issues. One, they always have their own agenda. It's unlikely to align with yours. So on a short term, it may work, but on a long term, you may create a problem for yourself because then there's issue number two, they have leverage. They have all your sales channel, they know your uh, product, they know your competitive edge. Um, so if you're no longer working with them, they may start to compete with you or they may start to work with your competitor and they know a lot of your information. Um, so what I would say, if you work with a distributor or a joint venture partner, there need to be a good reason. A good reason could be you don't want to put a big investment or they have the resources and you want, you want to have a Kickstarter in China. If not, consider setting up your own company and that basically applies for all situations. Now, one of my clients, they were a global supplier of Bosch. Bosch told them, um, export or re-import, I don't agree. Domestic trading agent, I don't agree. Joint venture partner, I don't agree. I want you to be in China. You invoice me with your entity, with your subsidiary. You need to be in control of the quality of the product. You need to communicate with my team locally, otherwise, I find another partner. Okay, looking at selling services um, in China. There again, the trend uh, for me on the next slide is offering these services in China for China. So there's an increased demand for high quality services. There's especially an increased pool of very talented local staff, Chinese that have studied abroad, that speak perfect English, that understands the local culture uh, and that are quite creative, uh, I must say, I experienced uh, personally. So services are, are, are getting very popular in China for, for foreign companies. So I distinguish three main business models. One, you do it cross-border. So you may have a liaison office here. You may have some partners that introduce your business. A couple of big issues. There's no face-to-face -face, uh, meetings or, or, or time when you really need it. Just a couple of years during a visit. 
in COVID times, that proves extremely difficult, of course. Um, there's no after, uh, after sales service uh, once you've delivered the service. Um, there's a cultural barrier, of course, uh, and, it, and the delivery of service is extremely slow because of the distance. One step uh, deeper, you could um, you could work with a domestic reseller, for example, if you have uh, if you have uh, some some online services, or you can find a, a partner. Issue there is you may face a low uh, service quality level from your partner. Uh, that would not be good for your brand image. Um, and again, here you're creating a, a competitor. So if you can do it, they can learn from you, and they can do exactly the same. They have your whole uh, your whole sales channel, all your pipeline. Uh, because they've been doing the marketing for you mainly. Um, and of course, you have different culture. So that makes for a very challenging uh, marriage, especially if you do it at a, at, at a distance. So finally, if we, if we move to, um, to you making uh, the big step into China, um, and that means you be on the ground, you're showing commitment to con Chinese consumers and your business partners, uh, in China. To me, that's all driven by increased competition in China locally amongst uh, local companies, but also amongst foreign companies. And many of you, uh, um, you know your competitors, uh, you know your, your friends, many are doing business already in China. And because I believe that doing business in, in China requires very strong partners. Um, and they want to see a local commitment in order uh, for them to team up with you. Uh, Chinese consumers uh, request extremely quick delivery. Um, they want 24 hour customer uh, service, customer engagement. Um, you likely need to be hire a local staff to, uh, to deal with the delivery and, and, and customer engagement. Um, your, your clients B2B, they require importing a local uh, RMB invoicing. Um, if you want to uh, buy and sell local, uh, locally in China, you, I, I recommend you definitely uh, have a Wufi and a lot of clients require warehousing in China uh, if sales are, are ramping up and that would also require a, a Wufi uh, if you don't want to have any financial uh, risks there using, uh, using third parties. So the real solution there is, is setting up uh, your own company if, if China is really a market for you. Um, and if you're sure about that, uh, some companies need, need some time. They need to do some market research. Others are very sure because they have a couple of clients or they know that their competitors are all there. They don't want to lose any time. Setting up in China in COVID time would take three to four months, including a bank account. You can do that remotely. Um, so with our relation, you can open a company and you can open a, a bank account in, in China as well. Uh, uh, virtually, usually via WeChat, uh, by video call with the authorities in the bank. A company itself is a typical limited liability company, so you're liable to the capital that you committed to. Um, there are few restrictions. Most industries are, are open for 100% foreign ownership. Um, I feel that in these industries, there is definitely a level playing field. If you look at the funds, um, there are no minimum uh, capital uh, requirements anymore. Um, you have no uh, contribution deadlines. You can set a capital and you can contribute that well, usually within 30 years, the lifetime of a company. And yes, in contrary to most widespread belief, it is possible to get your cash out of China, uh, either through profit distribution or through service invoice. Of course, if you're trading with China and you're, you're importing, uh, to China from Canada, you can just pay for these uh, uh, these products and you can have the line share of your profit land in Canada. There is no issue to that. If you have good planning and I can assist with that, um, then your cash will not be trapped in, in China, at least by large, not the majority of it. Okay, then my favorite part, uh, contract negotiation. So if you if you find uh, found a partner or, or, or a supplier, a distributor, a joint venture partner, uh, any commercial partnership uh, agreement, um, you would need to be um, negotiating contracts. And that goes uh, tremendously 
different than than that would probably go in in in, in Canada. I, I think you'd be surprised. I, mean, I come from the Netherlands myself, and and I was extremely uh, surprised on the negotiation tactics of uh, Chinese. I think by by now I've mastered some of them, but I I think I haven't seen uh, all the local practices and. And some call it tricks. I just call it extremely good negotiations that uh, that, that uh, the Chinese do. So I always share with my uh, my audience that there's three simple principles. First, there's no win-win in China. Chinese rather prefer to have a bigger share of a smaller pie um, than the other way around. Um, in China, there's definitely always multiple truths. Um, and I think that, that that goes, of course, for, for every situation. Um, Chinese are not looking for an optimal solution. They're looking for a solution that works for them. So never try to convince them that there's a vast solution for both parties. They are only interested in their benefit. Um, so it doesn't work to use this argument. I. I think I can best um, summarize it um, that China has no win-win by saying that there's only one win-win and that's a panda in the Beijing Zoo called win-win. Um, for China, when you come to China, be patient. When you negotiate, uh, it's going to be a very long and complicated uh, process. When you think you're there, you're, you're probably not by far there. Um, so I recommend that you never show the back of the thong, at least not immediately. Take a very long time uh, before you do that. When you go on a business trip and you meet your partner, take it a long time. Never tell them when your flight back is going to be. Because if they know it, they're going to play the last card just before you have to go, get into the car to go to the airport. Um, so one of my clients, they're new to China, but I think they're very good negotiators. They visit their partners three or four times. They spend thousands and thousands of US dollars uh, to fly into China to do the negotiations. Um, they bring us as a lawyer. And at the end of the day, they're walking away if they don't get the deal that they want. And that's exactly what Chinese are doing. Time is not a cost to them. And I think to us in the Western world, we see time as a cost. It's a lost opportunity and we could have done something else with their time. A lot of uh, Chinese companies see time as a negotiation tool. So be as patient as, as they are. Um, when you have a deal, expect that the Chinese uh, side will always renegotiate this deal. And this is a common uh, Chinese business practice. So it's, it's nothing unethical. And they, they just say, well, our relationship evolves and so should the contract and so should our, our term. Some, some very favorable Chinese tactics of, of, of mine is do nothing. So you have a meeting, no follow up. They don't show any eagerness. So you feel you have to offer something to them in order to get the deal. And that's exactly what they want. Um, another favorite of mine is artificial deadlines. For some reason they're saying that there is a deadline and if you don't deal with them before that time, the deal is off. The government is not supporting the project. It's not giving them a subsidy. They're going to work with another partner. They're talking to your competitor and, and there's a deadline of 30 September. If we don't have a deal, then uh, we're never going to cooperate together. Obviously, that, that that line is so artificial that it's just being postponed for eight times and finally, six months later, you have a deal um, or one month later, hopefully. Finally, have no shame. And this is what my clients always tell me. Like, don't they have shame? Are, are they not ashamed of their their tactics? And the answer is usually no. So in China, play by the Chinese rules, leave your Western ethics uh, at home, um, but learn more about the Chinese ethics. So Chinese ethics can be a lot about uh, giving someone face, uh, having, having your tea time, having your lunch time, going out for, for a drink together, of course, uh, play by their rule, be very polite, um, but your business ethics can very well uh, better be, be changed. Um, we see a lot of ridiculous arguments. Eh? 
for instance, um, no, we cannot do this deal unless you come to China and notarize um, this agreement uh, at, at the local notary in, in, in China. And this is obviously ridiculous. There's no law like this. We all know this. Um, yeah, but it's just one of their one of their tactics to either delay or to get you to to, to China so they can create leverage. Um, on your side, always renegotiate as well. Um, this is very normal. They expect you to do this because they will do the same. Um, and especially if the level playing field has changed. So if you have leverage, use it. Maybe you don't have leverage right now, but maybe you have leverage uh, down the road when the contract is signed. Use that moment uh, to rene renegotiate the contract and definitely don't be Santa Claus. Okay, that brings me to the last topic. And that is employment in China. So I, I, what, what I will not be focusing on um, are employment solutions in China. What I would like to focus on, um, okay, I'm now trying to find my screen here. There we go. Yeah, is is giving you um, giving you some 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 tools on how to approach China. So a lot of companies say, well, we have employees in China, we have operations in China, but actually, they have either someone that they feel is staff, or they have staff at their factory, because they want to explore the market. And and I don't think this is necessarily bad. Of course, I can tell you this is all not compliant and some of it is, is illegal and you're facing big risks. Uh, but I understand it. You, you need to, you need to uh, uh, have, have a taste of, of, of China and, and how to better do that than, than uh, have some, some Chinese staff that can support you there. So I distinguish local employment relationships and service relationships. At the local employment relationship, there's two options. You, you hire them directly or you hire them indirectly. If you do it directly, your only option is a representative office. I don't recommend it. Um, or, or, with your, uh, or a joint venture. But this requires a company incorporation. So co some companies that really want to um, test the market a little bit, I understand you may want to do that uh, either indirectly or from overseas. Indirectly, what is popular in China is, is something that I would call an employer of record or some, uh, especially in America, they call a professional employer, employer organization. To me, it's the same. It means you have a service company in China who is hiring the employee on their own behalf, but they do it for you. So what you do is you have a service contract with them and you're saying, I would like a person um, to provide me these services and that would be a person that's on the payroll of the employer of record or, or the PEO. So basically what you're doing is you're telling them this is my employee please hire him for me. You're circumventing dispatchment restrictions in China uh, because you need proper licenses for this and the law prescribes now that a Chinese company cannot dispatch on behalf of a foreign entity. Um, so all these companies doing that are at risk there's a PE risk. I think the risk is, is, is pretty limited, but in general, I'd be hesitant to, to apply this, uh, uh, this, this model. Um, other companies are engaging uh, Chinese citizens in a service relationship, so they will be independent consultants. The issue with this is it's hard to make local payments. It's... Um, it's difficult to pay social insurance and to have a, uh, to have commitment from from your staff or to pay the taxes. In general, um, a question I get a lot is: Can foreigners get a get a, a residence or work permit in China? Yes, if you have a bachelor degree and you have two years experience in China, generally you're eligible uh, for for a work permit in China. Okay, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I'll, I'll be available for the Q&A later. Oh, Robin, thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation. 
Um, I, I will let you go for now, but uh, don't go too far as we uh, will come back to the uh, Q&A in a few minutes. Um, at this point, I would like to uh, invite David Groover, uh, Director of Operations at Crudat, to join me on the screen. Crudat is a company coming from the entertainment industry, active in Canada and the US. Most recently, Crudat launched in China, and David will tell us a bit more about his experience starting his uh, business in China. Over to you, David. All right, uh, thanks a lot, Philip. Uh, thanks, Robin. A lot of good stuff in there uh, that we had to follow. Uh, all right, so um, I'm David Gruber, uh, the crew that uh, we're a service company specialized in rigging and tents, installation for setup and tear down of corporate events in the entertainment sports industry, theme parks as well. So we offer um, training for specialized rigging courses. Uh, to the standard of uh, international standard of ERADA and ETCP for rope access, for example. Uh, we're, uh, we're in the process of selling also a specialized climbing rigging product <clears throat> as a distributor. Uh, we deploy our staff around China, uh, including Macau. We have a, a wide range of service, uh, on-site services on, on production sites, as, such as uh, translators, riggers, acrobatic riggers, electrician, uh, heavy machinery operators, technical directors, project managers, and uh, we work uh, directly with uh, designers and engineers depending on the project. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so yeah, the, um, we have experience uh, in China for the past two years. We were introduced initially for, uh, for the project in a theater in the Sanya uh, for the Atlantis show. And then we were in Hangzhou for Cirque du Soleil, Wuxi for uh, Dragon uh, production. And um, that's, that was the introduction. Uh, I've been in uh, Shanghai since January to do the startup. And uh, a lot of what Robin was saying, we basically followed that uh, through the Wufi, the foreign company, and established an office uh, in Shanghai. So uh, during, the, <laughs> during the pandemic, uh, period uh, had to go through a lot of things, but uh, luckily we were able to, um, throughout those two years, uh, we were lucky to find some local partners. Uh, they do martial art, uh, flying rigging and the uh, gaming industry uh, and um, the theaters as well. So uh, uh, um, we connected also with the Ca Canadian Chamber of Commerce, CanCham. Uh, we had the chance to make a strategic partnership uh, during that process. So um, also uh, during that period of pandemic, uh, doing a startup, uh, we were able to find our uh, general manager uh, that, is, that is a local Chinese that's been working in the industry for 20 years. So we established a really good connection. And I think the, what Robin was saying regarding the patient and the time invested, it was a good period for, uh, you know, for myself to uh, establish those connections and, uh, you know, gain confidence and also uh, uh, with our um, international reputation, the local Chinese uh, companies, uh, um, we attract uh, international companies to go to invest in, in China with those projects. So for them, it's, it looks really good to, uh, you know, to have a partnership with uh, a company like ours. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, the setup, uh, the startup, uh, process, uh, during, uh, during the, the pandemic period uh, in Shanghai. Uh, I could talk for a long time regarding that. That was uh, quite something, but, uh, we made it through and, uh, we have the license, um, and, uh, we're registered. We have the scope, you know, uh, what Robin was saying is really important because for example, right now we have a client that is uh, requiring a certain specific work from us, but the, the scope of work, the wording for the license is really uh, essential to make sure that you have everything in hand because um, uh, if you have a few words missing, then we got to go back to the board and, and you know, it's, it's not a long process, but it's just a learning curve, you know. Um, so um, the trademark also uh, IP, uh, we uh, offer training and uh, we designed a rigging course um, for the industry, for theaters and also, you know, uh, the rigging in general. So uh, 
very important to have uh, the IP and trademark as well for the, the name. So, um, and um, that's pretty much uh, the the overall of of my story here. I could go go on and on for the period of time uh, regarding the the setup uh, because it's a uh, it's unusual to try to <laughs> open up a, a, a foreign company in China during a, a pandemic. Uh, but I also um, I think relationships are are the key factor and. Um, being there on site and uh, you know maintaining those relationships is is it was really the key to all of that and you know, show that we're we're there for a long time because Chinese they really foresee a future and it's not a short term and we're not just there to we're, we're there to stay and to build a reputation so that's uh that's it Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, David, uh, for, for uh, telling us about your, your journey in uh, establishing business in China. Uh, maintenant, j'ai l'honneur d'accueillir M. Jean-François Lépine, directeur des représentations du Québec en Chine. M. Lépine nous parlera des bureaux du Québec en Chine et de leurs services aux entreprises québécoises. M. Lépine, je vous cède maintenant la parole. Uh, OK. Je démarre la vidéo. <coughs> Merci. Beaucoup. Philippe, vous m'entendez bien? Je vous entends très bien, mon cher. Bon. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup, Philippe. Euh, merci euh, à Robin et David euh, de, ce, de ces deux présentations. C'est euh, vraiment très intéressant. Je voudrais d'abord aussi euh, remercier CCBC pour avoir contribué à l'organisation de cet événement ce soir, euh, ce matin votre heure, je pense. Et euh, euh, je voudrais remercier aussi Johansson et l'équipe d'investissement Québec International euh, comme co-participant aussi à cet événement. Et puis, remercier le Bureau du Québec à Shanghai, Geneviève Roland, euh, qui euh, est notre directrice économique à Shanghai pour euh, la participation à l'organisation de l'événement. So I want to thank uh, CCBC, um, Robin, David, uh, uh, Investissement Québec International, and uh, Geneviève uh, Johansson from Investissement Québec International, and uh, Geneviève Roland from our uh, Quebec office here in Shanghai. I just arrived in Shanghai, by the way. I'm starting my quarantine, just to tell you our situation, but I'm very happy to hear what I heard from uh, David and uh, Robin, uh, mainly from Robin, uh, the um, description of the evolution of the um, situation in terms of law and, and uh, controls and transparency in China, I, I think, and I, I'm an advocate of uh, obviously uh, doing business in China. And I think there is, um, there has been recently, um, um, in, in recent years, an evolution in, in the situation being more transparent, more clear uh, 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 as far as foreign investors or entrepreneurs doing business in China. The situation is getting clearer and clearer every day. Uh, but as David said, I mean, there's a big challenge here. Um, uh, they, uh, um, Guy Saint-Jacques, our former um, uh, Canadian ambassador in China, uh, was uh, always says about the win-win uh, situation in China that we have to be aware of the fact that uh, we are all looking and the Chinese are always talking about the win-win situation when we deal with them, but he always reminds us that the win, the two win are on the same side when we deal with China. So that's why it's important, as Robin told you, that we have to be tough. We have to really uh, fight for our, our, our rights, but there are a lot of opportunities. The situation is more transparent and business is, um, is, is uh, the business uh, opportunities are there and the business context 
uh, helps us to to win more space in 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 the Chinese market. And as uh, David said, um, the, um, the it's possible to protect our IP. It's possible to um, to protect ourselves in this huge market. And uh, there is a lot of opportunities. He, ta he told us about uh, what they are doing in China. So I think um, so. I think this is quite important to know. Uh, three points that I want to make uh, very shortly. First of all, everybody has to know that the activities here in China are really coming back to normal. We have seen uh, recently, and we're going to see uh, during the coming months, uh, physical activities like big exhibitions, um, which are not taking place elsewhere in the world, but which are taking place here. There was uh, recently the, the World Winter Sport Expo where Quebec companies took part either by their representatives in China or online. Uh, the, um, for example, the big uh, China International Import Expo in Shanghai uh, due to take place in November will take place. <clears throat> and there will be a Quebec pavilion at this expo. <clears throat> Sorry, and um, uh, uh, there are going to be a physical presence for Quebec companies who have uh, decided to take place either by their local representatives or maybe if China allows it uh, with uh, people coming from, um, uh, from Quebec directly. Uh, we are still hoping that uh, the borders in China will open eventually more easily um, but still I, if you look at my situation i still have to do a 14 days uh, quarantine as i just arrived yesterday so we're not seeing that now but uh, we hope uh, contacts will will be able to um, to be established more uh, physical contacts more easily in the coming months second important point just to give you an idea of what's going on in China, as far as Quebec is concerned, from January 2020, January this year to July this year, our exports in China, talk about Quebec, have increased by 23.6%, which is a lot more than the Canadian average. So there is uh, something going on here, this market, uh, I mean, the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, problem is controlled here. Uh, most of the activities are going on normally. So there, is a, there are a lot of opportunities. We can help you to be in contact with these opportunities, even if you are in Quebec and you cannot travel in China, because we have 22 people here in China working for you uh, and to help you to, to get in contact with your partners in China so we can do a lot for you. Same thing with our federal colleagues from the Canadian Embassy, Canadian Consulates in uh, Shanghai, uh, Chongqing, uh, Guangzhou. So we're there to help you even if we cannot physically uh, do business together. And finally, um, we have to tell you that all our uh, employees are fully in their office working uh, so there is uh, you can contact us anytime and um, we're available nous sommes disponibles uh, pour vous uh, nous sommes très actifs actuellement uh, donc uh, contactez nous um, contact us by any means uh, we uh, can do a lot for you and we also have developed on a développé au cours des dernières semaines toute une façon de vous représenter encore davantage qu'avant en étant en vous représentant même auprès de vos clients directement. So, um, mainly, we are there to help you and we think and we, there are, as, as I told you, examples and results, uh, making sure or, or giving you a great example of what's going on here. It's still a huge market, the biggest market in the world. 
and there's a lot of business to do here. We are here to uh, represent you and help you. Merci beaucoup. Donc, on est là pour vous. Merci, Philippe, de cette occasion de nous, de, de nous exprimer. J'ai peut-être parlé trop longtemps, mais... Non, non, euh, c'est parfait. Que... Merci, merci bien, M. Lépine. Euh, mais mais oui. par contre, nous sommes juste au-dessus de, de, de notre temps. Et puis, nous avons reçu quelques questions. Je vais, je vais coordonner, juste laisser l'auditoire savoir que je vais co coordonner avec euh, nos panélistes pour, euh, pour offrir des réponses par écrit. Euh, je vais être conscient du temps de tout le monde. I want to be cautious uh, with everybody's time. We're just above our time. And we did receive a few uh, questions. And I'll, I'll follow up with, with our speakers and, and we can uh, offer answers in, in writing. Um, avant de, de clore la séance d'aujourd'hui, je voudrais porter votre attention euh, sur le prochain événement du CCBC, euh, soit notre prochaine rencontre dans la série des orateurs distingués qui se tiendra le 24 septembre. Vous trouverez l'information pour vous inscrire sur notre site web. J'aimerais remercier Investissement Québec et euh, Joanne Sun, Investissement Québec International, pardonnez-moi, et Joanne Sun pour leur participation. Euh, aussi remercier Robin Tabers of uh, RNP China Lawyers. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning or, uh, or rather this evening to share these uh, very insightful and uh, useful information. Monsieur Jean-François Lépine des bureaux du Québec euh, en Chine, euh, merci beaucoup pour votre participation. Euh, à tous les membres de ce panel et euh, au public, je vous, je vous souhaite une excellente journée et nous vous reverrons très bientôt, je l'espère. Merci.